This is the new Toyota GR86, and it's a little bit like a Kakapo. You have no idea what a Kakapo is, do you? Well, it's a parrot that's nocturnal and ground dwelling. It can't fly, and it comes from New Zealand. And the reason it's like this car is because it's about to go extinct, and it's very, very rare. There's only 140 Kakapos left in the world. In terms of the GR86, they're very rare as well. Toyota hasn't announced how many will come to the UK, but they've all sold out. In fact, they sold out in just 90 minutes. And being a naturally aspirated rear drive sports car, it's heading for extinction because of electrification. Anyway, in this video, I'm going to tell you everything you need to know about this car. I'm going to talk you around the exterior, show you the inside, see how practical it isn't. I'm going to take it for a drive, and of course, I'm going to launch it to see how quick it is from 0 to 60 miles an hour because I'm Matt Watson and you're watching Car Wow. And I don't even care that it's raining, I'm going to launch it anyway. My time might be crap. Well, it might be good. You'll find out how good a driver I am by how close my time is to the claimed figure from Toyota. No pressure. Buy, sell, car, wow. Let's start this video by talking about the design of the GR86. So it's based on the same platform as the GT86, but all the bodywork is new. I like the rear end on it, this integrated ducktail spoiler, the curvaceous shapely lights, yeah, GR badging there, and twin exhaust pipes. They are quite fat, the pipes, but they are real. Look, there's no fakery. Very good Toyota, keeping it real. Moving down the side, you've got 18-inch alloy wheels, and they're painted black, and the design apparently has been inspired by Japanese swords. As you move down the side, you can see these integrated side skirts, once again, looking very nice black door mirrors and big air vent there. The old GT86 had a horrible like plasticky badge there with two pistons and the 86 logo. That's much better. And they're functional, they work. And they combine with this vent here to smooth airflow down the side and over the wheels. Here at the front sort of reminds me a little bit of a modern day Supra, more so than the current Supra. And unlike the current Supra, there's no fake vents on this. They're all real, all do something. Once again, you've got your GR badge in there. I think it's really nice. I like it in this paint, though this paint is an optional extra. It's the only option on this car and it costs just under a thousand pounds. Still, this is quite a decent priced car. The manual version of this, you can get an automatic as well, starts at just under 30,000 pounds. Now, if you're thinking about buying a new car and you need to sell your current car, you should check out Carway. It's the easy way to sell your car. All you have to do is upload some photos, give a brief description, then our dealers bid on your car and you just pick the highest offer. They'll come to your house, take your car away, put the money in your account, simple. If you want to check that out now, click on the pop-out banner up there. I'll put the link in the description below. Alternatively, if you want to do it at a later date or tell your friends and family about the service, then simply Google help me car wow and we will help you sell your car. On the inside, the GR86 is a very driver-focused car, so you've got a beautiful driving position. There's sufficient adjustment in the wheel, not loads, but enough. You sit right squarely to the wheel, though. Lovely, lovely, and nice and low, which is important in a car such as this. Also, the dash design, it's functional and sporty at the same time. I quite like it. You've got this stepped appearance to it. Materials at the top are squidgy. Go a bit further down there, we've got some scratchiness and a bit scratchy down here. That's yeah, fairly sturdy. I do like the layout, though. It's all quite simple, so you go heat your seat controls there, your buttons for the drive mode and the stability control. Manual handbrake, manual gearbox, all good. And you control the climate through this section of buttons here. Plus, look, you have the climate control buttons in these dials themselves. Reminds me a little bit of an Audi TT, though the interior isn't quite as nice as that car. And if you want to see my full in-depth video review of the Audi, click on the pop-out banner up there for the link in the description. But it's easy to set your temperature and it's good that you don't have to do the temperature controls through the touchscreen, which is an adequate touchscreen. Fairly basic to tell you the truth doesn't have inbuilt satellite navigation but it doesn't matter because you're just going to connect your phone and use apple carplay or android auto if you're normal now in terms of storage the glove box on this car is 25 percent bigger than on the gt86 even though a lot of the other things are very very similar look it's a decent size for a sports car that speaking of which you've got some door bins which are a reasonable size as well i like the fact that you get some suede like material up here on the door the door trims are quite soft and squidgy as well though there is some scratchy plastics i just like the fact that you have big sun visors which is great when you're driving into oncoming sun and big vanity mirrors with nice lights in them and look I like the lights here as well sometimes the lights inside a car are real faff to operate these are just dead simple you just press the light and it works exactly as you think it should sometimes they don't I don't know why. Now, another thing that you've got are some beautiful sports seats, which hold you nicely in place when you're going quickly. Important on a car like this. And once again, you've got that suede effect material here. It's all very nice on the inside. Functional, sporty, feels well made, just not the poshest. But what do you expect? Now I'm going to have to do the hard thing. <sighs> Let's check out the back seats because this is a four-seater. More like a two plus two, as you'll see now. Pull this lever. Move the... This... Yeah. yeah. Oh. Really? You have to do that? No. 
if you have a quick look here, you will see there is no space for your legs when someone sat in the front. Darren, could you come around and sit in this driver's seat for me, just to illustrate what it's like if you ever dare to carry someone behind you. It's the kind of discomfort you're gonna cause. Get into your ideal driving position, can you? Yeah, I don't think that's gonna happen. Okay, let me get my legs up a little bit. Try now. Is that your ideal driving position? Don't be frightened, get it exactly where you want it, yeah. So you can sort of make this work. Now my head is pressing quite hard against the back window. Still, better to have these seats than those seats. And look, you've got some ice fix anchor points there. And you can fit a child seat in the back of here. Bit of a fiddle sometimes trying to locate those short anchor points which are hidden in there. And you do have to move the front passenger seat quite a way forward. But you can sort of make it work. And it's the kind of car that you will try and make things work because you just want it because it's just totally awesome. Although this bit isn't quite so awesome. Oh well. It's a similar story with the boot. So depending on which way you look at it, it could be massively compromised or actually a bit of a bonus. For instance, oh God, I keep on forgetting where the button is. I think it's down there, but it's actually just there. Annoying. I'm sure you get used to that if you own this car. Anyway, the boot capacity, 226 litres. So you know, it's half the capacity of a BMW 2 Series, but it's actually twice the capacity of a Mazda MX-5. And because you can fold the back seats down, you can do some serious Christmas shopping with it. I went shopping for Christmas, look. I bought a Christmas tree. And amazingly, I could carry it in this sporty car. Ah, there we go, it fits. You wouldn't be able to do that in a Mazda MX-5. I guess you just like fold down the roof and have it sticking up right. Which just bring on to the point of the fact it's a bit of a shame you can't get a convertible version of this GR86 because that will rule it out for some people. Though you can't really buy one anyway because they're all sold out. That brings us on to five or nine things about this car. There is a distinct problem with the location of the cup holders. I'm driving along in my manual car. I want to change gear quickly. Oh dear. Everything is very wet. Unlike some other cars, the reversing camera doesn't have a wash function, so it gets covered in crap. And if you want to see out of it, then you have to get out of the car and give it a wipe. And now you can see me. A sporty car such as this should have a very loud and aggressive get out of my way sort of horn. But instead, its horn sounds like this. Uh, excuse me, would you mind uh, just sort of letting me past if you don't mind? <laughs> For some reason, the manual version of the GR86 just has normal bog standard cruise control, whereas you get clever adaptive cruise control, which can keep you a safe distance from the car in front and auto steer to keep you in lane if you have the automatic version. Now, I might be thinking that's because they can't possibly have that system working with the manual gearbox, but with a Toyota GR Yaris, you have fully automatic cruise control and it's manual. So why haven't they deployed that same tactic here? It's very annoying. Another thing that you don't get on the manual version of the GR86, which you do on the GR Yaris, is an auto blip function when you change down a gear. And you might be thinking, well, you should be able to hit and toe anyway, but sometimes you might not want to, and you can always turn it off if you don't want to use it. Better to have the option. Anyhow, it's not all bad. Here's five cool things about the GR86. And one thing that is definitely better than the GR Yaris is the sound of the engine. For starters, it's got four cylinders instead of three. There's no turbocharger, it's an actual aspirated, and it's a boxer flat four, which sounds nice. Go on, start it up, let's, let's hear some revs. Rev it. More. Oh, it's got a really nice hard edge mechanical sound, and there's no soft limiters. There's no ratchet system for the seat back recliners. Now you get good old Toyota style one handle simple release. So you can be like. <laughs> the old GT86 had the same tyres on it as the Toyota Prius, which were basically low grip tyres for efficiency rather than high grip tyres for handling which is what this car has. They've upgraded to Michelin Pilot Sport 4s, which should help me when I come to launch it a little bit later in the video. I like the way that when you start this car, you get the GR logo spin around and then these lines move in and out like the Boxster engine punching like that. Seems a bit rude. Anyway, <laughs> I always like the fact that you get some dedicated performance dials. Look, there's a lap timer there. Then you have a power and torque curve and a G-meter. Plus, when you put the car into track mode, not only does it reduce the stability control intervention, for a bit more fun, you also get some bespoke dials, which focus on revs. Though, actually, I prefer the normal dials. They just look better. Unlike other Toyotas, the GR86 gets a three-year instead of the normal five-year warranty, which you might be thinking, oh, it's a bit rubbish. However, if you get the car serviced, 
for the next seven years of a Toyota dealer, they will add on an extra year's warranty, which means that theoretically in total, you could have 10 years warranty. The GR86 is based on the same chassis as the GT86, but it's been significantly overhauled. So while the exterior dimensions are the same, underneath, it's a bit different. For instance, you've got a rated suspension with new dampers and springs. You've also got the anti-roll bars now connected to the subframes to make them stiffer. Speaking of stiffness, Toyota have used extra bonding in the body to make it even more rigid than before. In places, it's 50% stiffer than the GT86 was. That's not all though. They fitted it with an aluminium bonnet and roof to help keep the weight down. That said, it still weighs in at 1,276 kilos, which is 50 kilograms heavier than the GT86. I wonder if that increase in weight is to do with the bigger engine. Here it is then, a 2.4 litre Boxer four-cylinder engine, which is an increase in capacity of 400cc over the two litre Boxer four in the GT86. Power is up to 234 horsepower compared to 200 in the GT86, but more importantly, torque is up as well. 250 newton meters in this compared to 205 newton meters in the old GT86. That was a problem with that car is a little bit gutless you still got the same setup in the way that it's front engine rear wheel drive and you can get it with a six speed manual or a six speed automatic also you've got a limited slip differential on the rear axle as well proper sports car setup the only problem is is that they're all sold out so you can't buy one so what i'm going to do instead is configure another good sports car on the car wag configurator here i'm going to pick my favorite engine and spec of that car and if you want to see what that car is and the saving through car wag, just click on the pop out banner up there for the link in the description below to go check it out might seem a little bit odd to start the driving section of a review of a sports car such as the GR86 by testing it in town. But it's actually quite important because sometimes you're gonna to have to drive a car like this in town. So let's see what it's like. First things first, the view out the front window, also known as the windscreen, is brilliant. Got a low dash, it's nice and wide. The rear view mirror doesn't obscure much. It's not like the Toyota GR Yaris, which I've got. The view out the front is terrible. This is really nice. Even though you're sitting dead low down, great visibility you've got a good view out the back window as well the other thing is the turning circle is quite good 10.8 meters look i'm going to do u-turn in this little spot here look i'm going to cock it up now not make it around oh i am look hey, 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 let's do it with that curb in these wheels yeah look at that so the turning circle is not quite as good as a mazda mx5 which is really tight but it's better than an audi tt or a bmw 2 series makes it easy to drive in town and the steering is reasonably light when you're just pottering around like this. So the brakes, they're strong, but they have feel to them. So it's easy to control them. You can just reduce your speed very gradually if you want to. They never feel grabby. Yet if you stomp on them, boy, they work really well. Now, if you are going to be spending a lot of time in town, you might think, oh, do you know what? I might get the automatic version of this car, but no! Do not do that. Do not buy a car like this and get the auto. Please don't, because half the joy is changing gear and even changing gear in town is fun because you're just interacting with the car and the clutch pedal, it's not too firm and the gear change is just glorious. Oh. You know, when you're bored, stuck at a traffic light, don't get on your phone, which is illegal. Just instead, row the gears a little bit and be thankful that you bought a really exciting, fun manual sports car. Well done you. Tap, tap, tap. You're a true motoring enthusiast. There is something else I should point out about this car as you're driving around town. Suspension. Yes, it's a sports car, so it's on the firm side, but it's not uncomfortable. Even when you go over bumps, let me find some bumps to go over. Classic, isn't it? The time when you need to find some bumps to illustrate in a video, you can't find any. Normally, there's loads of bumps over British town and village roads. Oh, here's a manhole cover, let's do that, there's a drain. Yeah, that's fine. There's another bump there. Oh, yeah, that's fine. It's because the car's relatively light. It doesn't need firm suspension to stop it leading too much in the bends. It's good. I'm comfy in it. I can feel the road through my bottom, but I want to in a sports car, but it's not uncomfy. It's how it should be. Actually, do you know what? Even in that little drive just there through town, haven't razzed this car, I can sense that it is a great car just through the controls. Everything that I touch and interact with just feels right well judged like they spent a lot of time working on it and that really is a great sign and now we're going to go quicker and this is where it should excel oh by the way great day for testing a rear drive sports car good old Britain. can you hear that there is a downside to this car one of the ways they've made this car light is to not fit it with that much soundproofing as a result 
you get a lot of road noise entering the cabin and reverberating around. That is tiresome on a long journey. You're gonna to have to turn up your stereo quite loud. Another thing I've noticed is if you're doing Bluetooth calls, you have to talk quite loud so that people can understand what you're saying. The person on the other end of the phone knows for sure that you're driving. One of the problems with the old GT86 was that the engine was gutless. So let's try this one. I'm gonna accelerate in fourth gear from 40 miles an hour like I'm joining a motorway. Here we go. It's all right. You still have to rev it to get the most out of it. And it doesn't take off like a turbocharged coupe would do, but it's all right. However, I think if you are doing lots and lots and lots and lots of miles, and you want a sporty looking car that's also fun to drive, you might be better off with a BMW 2 Series. And if you want to see my full in-depth video review of that car, just click on the pop-out banner up there for the link in the description below. Me though, I would have this, and I'll tell you why now. You see, you get this thing on a twisty road, Oh, and it's just so f***ing awesome. I love it. I prefer this than the old GT86. The extra power makes a difference. You can just control the car a bit better. You don't have to rev the nuts off it so much, even though you do rev the nuts off it still. But that mid-range punch just gives you more control. So when the back end starts to slide, you can apply some throttle. It will send the weight to the back, give you more grip, and oh, yeah, you can dial out the oversteer. And the gear shift just comes alive out here. I mean, it's great round town, but here on a twisty road, and the pedals are close enough together that you can actually heel and toe, unlike in my GR Yaris. Now, if I was in my GR Yaris, though, I would be able to get a bit quicker on these roads because four-wheel drive traction. But this is remaining fairly stable considering. And because it's not got turbocharged punch with a load of torque, you don't just end up spinning up your rear wheels at any slight dab of the throttle. It's really, really good. Can't believe how much fun it is in the wet. Ooh, and then get on the power. Being rear-wheel drive as well. Classic sports car setup. Edge at the front, rear wheel drive, limited slip diff as well for improved corner exiting traction. It just delivers everything you want it to this car. It's the kind of car that you just take out for a drive. And even though it's fun, it doesn't feel like a compromise to live with either. Plus you've got the benefit, the fact it's a Toyota. So you know it's gonna be reliable and you've got that long warranty. I'm not making a profit on selling this to you. I don't need to sell it to you. Toyota doesn't need me to sell it to you. They've all been sold, it doesn't matter. But if you can somehow get your hands on one, do it. You will not regret it. <laughs> this is my kind of car. The GR86 is supposed to do 0-60 in 6.3 seconds. I'm going to see what it will really do with my specialist Tommy gear here. It's very wet. Come on. Got gear change though. 6.93? That is crazy. In these conditions, I can't believe it put its power down. If it was dry, I'll easily do 6.3. For those of you who are thinking, oh, you'd been quick if you had the automatic. Well, actually, no. Toyota says it's 0.6 of a second slower to 60 anyway. So that time that I did is the same time as the auto would have done in the dry. So there we go. So then what's my final verdict on the Toyota GR86? Should you avoid it? Should you consider it? Should you shortlist it? Or should you just go right ahead and buy it? Well, this verdict is pointless because you can't buy it. However, if you could buy a time machine and go back in time to when they originally put the car available for sale and you reacted within the first 90 minutes, then you could have bought one. And if you could do that, then you should do that. And this is the most nonsensical verdict I've ever given. Basically, I think this car is brilliant. And that's the end. I hope you all enjoyed the video. If you did, give it a like. Let me know if you agree with my verdict in the comments below. Click on those windows there for some more videos and on that box there to go to CarWow to sell your car the easy way.